So this is where we left off on chapter three. Uh, we went over, and actually let me go back to this table. Here we go. All right, classifications of matter. Um, and we were breaking, them de breaking down matter into different types of uh, categories. So we can organize them into pure substances or mixtures, and then pure substances get further broken down into elements. And elements are the simplest form of anything. You can't break it down into smaller pieces or simpler elements. Um, compounds are made up of molecules that are all of the same type. And so they will contain fixed ratios of uh, each of the different types of atoms that make up the molecules, uh, which is different from any of our mixtures. So mixtures are gonna contain uh, either different elements or different compounds in varying proportions. It's kind of like, um, uh, like if you're adding sugar to coffee, right, you can make coffee that has like a little bit of sugar or a lot of sugar or anywhere in between. Um, that's a varying proportion. <coughs> so swipe through this real quick. Um, we talked about how like these mixtures, homogeneous versus heterogeneous is a little bit of a gray area sometimes depending on how much of it you're looking at. If you look at the entire ocean as a whole, um, it's definitely heterogeneous because you're gonna have different compositions throughout. Even if you looked at the ocean at a single beach could be very heterogeneous because it's got different composition throughout. But if you went out and you grabbed a single cup of seawater, of ocean water, um, that's probably gonna be homogeneous. Although if you get sand in there too, then it's heterogeneous. Um, so the easiest way to remember heterogeneous things is they usually have like a solid that doesn't dissolve into the liquid, right? Like chicken noodle soup has chunks of chicken and noodle in it, carrots, um, orange juice with pulp, that pulp's not gonna always be completely distributed throughout. Um, yeah, so let's classify some of these types of matter. <clears throat> and so we're gonna do two different classifications here. We're gonna first determine is it a pure substance or is it a mixture? And then if it's a pure substance, whether it's an element or a compound. And if it's a mixture, then we're gonna say if it's ho uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous. So mercury and a thermometer. Like, yeah, pure substance. Does anybody think it's a mixture? Yep, pure substance. And then is it a element or a compound? Element. Does anybody disagree? Yeah, it would be an element. Mercury is one of those weird metals. It's actually the only metal that exists as, at a liquid at room temperature. Um, and aside from bromine is the only element. <coughs> um, yeah, so mercury in a thermometer would be just mercury. What about exhaled air, pure substance or mixture? mixture. Yeah, it's a mixture. And is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? It would be homogeneous. It would be homogeneous, because it's all gonna be mixed together evenly. Um, yeah. Chicken noodle soup, pure compound mixture. Yeah, mixture. Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Heterogeneous. Could you make it homogeneous? <laughs> or put it in a blender? <laughs> all right, if you blend it all together, then it's gonna be like evenly distributed throughout, then you'd have kind of gross homogeneous, or sorry, homogeneous. Homogeneous and homogeneous are two different things, although only very subtly. Um, and then sugar. Is, yeah, sugar is a pure substance. Is 
Is it an element or a compound? A compound. Yeah, be a compound. Sugar's made of um, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Cool. So I get back here to a summary of all, all of this. Matter can be a pure substance or maybe a mixture. Um, pure substances can be elements or compounds. Mixtures may either be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Um, and then mixtures can be composed of two or more elements, two or more compounds, or a combination of both. And then that's in varying proportions. Uh, one of the ways that you can study this kind of thing is you could write out um, like pure substance, mixture, like write out all of these terms and then try and sort it into like a decision tree, right? So taking at the first level um, a pure substance versus a mixture, right? How would you differentiate between those two and write that out, you know? <clears throat> and then for elements or compounds, again, make a decision tree. It's like what yes or no question or what question could you answer to say it's one or the other? Um, and if you can do that from memory, right, just from your own understanding of it, um, that's really good evidence that you've sort of grasped and mastered that concept. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about um, some other properties of matter. Uh, characteristics that distinguish one substance from another are called properties. Cool. But physical properties. Uh, are ones that a substance displays without changing its composition. Um, so like this characteristic odor of gasoline. So smells of things are going to be physical properties because smelling it does not change the thing that you're smelling. Um, taste, color, appearance, melting point, and density, all physical properties. You can observe a thing and it doesn't change, right? Chemical properties, on the other hand, are uh, properties that a substance displays only through changing its composition. So the flammability of gasoline, corrosiveness, acidity, toxicity, um, can only be displayed through changing its composition. So, right, you can't look at gasoline and tell if it's flammable. You can't look at, or you can't look at a clear liquid and just tell that it's flammable. You'd actually have to try and light it on fire to see that property. Or um, acetone will like dissolve or destroy some plastics, and you can't tell, unless you know exactly what the plastics are and what the you know, how those interact, you can't tell if the acetone is going to destroy a plastic just by looking at it. Like I don't know if splashing acetone on here would destroy this. That's a chemical property. Um, and if it's destroyed by the acetone, that would mean that like, the acetone is corrosive and that this can be corroded by acetone because there will be a chemical reaction happening there that changes the composition. So the atomic or molecular composition of a substance does not change when the substance displays its physical properties. Boiling point is another one, freezing point. Boiling point and freezing point are two other ones, right? If you freeze water, it's still water, it doesn't change it. If you boil water, it's still water. Um, now it's just steam, but you can condense it um, and get liquid water back. Most physical properties are going to be reversible or easily reversible. So the susceptibility of iron to rust uh, would be a chemical property. What's happening is it's actually reacting with oxygen in the air. That oxygen gets in between the iron atoms, um, like in this picture, and changes the composition of that iron and makes it really weak, changes the color, which is another sign of a chemical property or a chemical change. And so, to know that something will rust, you have to like observe that property. You have to see its composition change. All 
All right, so is the explosiveness of hydrogen gas chemical or physical property? Chemical. Burning, anytime there's burning, that's going to be a chemical. Something burns, it's a chemical property. But the bronze color of copper, physical. All right, it's an observation we can make um, without changing the composition. The shiny appearance of silver, physical again. The ability of dry ice to sublime or change directly from a solid to a gas. That one's a little trickier. What was that? Physical. Yeah, so just like water is boiling, it's changing from a liquid to a gas. Sublimation is the process of changing from a solid to a gas. And so all of the like bubbles and uh, gas that comes off of dry ice is just carbon dioxide, right? Because dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, it's all still carbon dioxide. <clears throat> all right, so now we're going to shift perspective a little bit. Those were chemical and physical properties. Now we're going to talk about chemical and physical changes. Um, so for a physical change, that's like boiling or melting or freezing. Those are changes where you're changing the physical state of the thing, but it still retains the same composition and identity. So the matter changes its appearance, but not its composition. So ice melting looks different, still water. Uh, in a chemical change, though, matter does change its composition. So it's becoming a new compound. So when copper turns green upon continued exposure to air, it's because it's reacting with oxygen in the air again to form a new compound, copper oxide. Just like when iron rusts, it's reacting with oxygen to form iron oxide. So as a rule, state changes or transformations from one state of matter to another, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, solid to gas, uh, those are always physical changes. Because we're not changing the composition of the thing again, we're just taking it from one state into another state. Um, and then in physical changes, the atoms that compose the matter don't change. So they're still the same atoms, and in a compound, they're still arranged in the same way. Yeah, so physical change results in a different form of the same substance. So it's just new form of the same thing, and usually really easy to go back to what it was before. All right, so like if you melt water, you can put it in the free, or if you melt ice, you can put it in the freezer and turn it back into ice um, easily. They're not all easy to reverse. Like if I cut, being like abusive to this table, but if I cut this table in half, that would be a physical change because it's still the table. It would be hard to put that back together. <laughs> chemical changes, chemical changes on the other hand, are where you're actually rearranging or reassociating the um, matter to create new matter with a new identity. And so a chemical change results in a new substance. And so this is sort of one of the you know, key concepts in chemistry, the chemical reaction. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to be looking at is the, or a lot of the things we'll be looking at are the chemical changes um, to take one substance and turn it into another, and how that process works, how do we understand it, um, how do we predict what's going to happen. So we're going to come back to this a lot. Everything on the left side. Time to wake up. So this is our reaction arrow in the middle here. 
um, almost always going from left to right, if not always, always. And so the left side of this is going to be our reactants. Those are the things that are being combined or decomposed. And then the products are the new compounds that are made from that chemical change. I have to sneeze. Uh, vaporization is a physical change. So it's taking a uh, liquid, turning it into a gas. So if you had a butane lighter, um, there's liquid butane inside of that lighter. When you press down the valve, that butane would rather be a gas, and so it gets expelled out of the nozzle, um, but will just become gaseous butane. So liquid butane in the lighter is going to have the same exact chemical structure as the gaseous butane outside the lighter. They're just different forms. So it'd be a physical change. But as soon as you uh, turn the flint and have enough heat, you can ignite that, that gaseous butane now um, and produce a flame. And in that flame, the butane, the butane molecules are reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, two different compounds than uh, the butane. So butane is uh, oh, it's too early for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, butane is C four H six ten. So it's four carbons, ten hydrogens, and in this reaction, well, with oxygen. We're changing it into carbon dioxide and water. Right, so now there's no more of the C C4H10. It's all CO2. So one carbon, two oxygens. That's carbon dioxide. And water, which is two hydrogens and one oxygen. You can see, too, that it, the oxygen was here, and it was part of our reactants. And so that's going to become part of both of these new compounds. All of the carbon from the butane gets turned into that CO2. The hydrogens from the butane become that other part of uh, water. They don't, no, they're, this is not balanced. Yeah, but that's a good point. So this is an unbalanced chemical reaction, and we'll get into this a little bit later. This is a preview of what's to come. Uh, all, of the, all of the atoms in the products have to be present in the reactants, because we can't create or destroy matter. So if we wanted to balance this, we would uh, add coefficients, because we don't have enough carbons there either. So we need four carbons there, um, and we would need or four carbon dioxides, five waters. Um, oh, of course, this is going to end up being one that's, uh, let's see, that's eight. And five would be 13 over two, so we have to multiply everything by two. But we'll get into that later. Um, this would be balanced, though. Usually, you don't leave a 13 over two. But yeah, you have to balance it. So everything in your reactants uh, has to also be present in your products, and vice versa, because they have to come from somewhere, and they have to go somewhere. OK, so chemical or physical, classifying these things as chemical or physical changes, not just properties. Uh, copper metal forming a blue solution when it's dropped into colorless nitric acid. Huh? Chemical, Chemical yeah. So we have copper here, uh, copper metal. So it's going to have like a bronzish copper color <laughs> to use it to describe itself. right? So it's going to be shiny. It's going to be a metal. You drop it into a colorless solution, and it dissolves. And so then turns blue. So because it's like all of its physical properties are changing, um, and you're getting a color change, that's indicative of a chemical change. So it'd be chemical. How about a train flattening a penny placed on a railroad track? Physical change, right? It's still made of, well, 
because pennies are mostly zinc now, but yeah, still zinc, copper, um, physical change. Ice melting into liquid water, physical. A match igniting a firework, chemical. If burning is ever involved, chemical change, every time. Um, so this is the distillation, which actually, if uh, you know anything about like moonshine, making moonshine, a still is a distillation apparatus. Um, wouldn't look like this one. Um, this is the kind that you would use uh, if you take OCHEM at some point, OCHEM lab, you'll use these. Unfortunately, we don't get to use them in uh, Chem 20. But you can use an apparatus like this to separate out compounds in a mixture based on their physical properties, namely their boiling points. So you could have a mixture in here of, um, you can actually do this uh, with like uh, orange peel. So if you like boil an orange peel in water, then it'll extract some of those oils and some of those oils, actually, I don't know how their boiling points compare to water, but they're probably lower. So if you boil this mixture together, the stuff that has a lower boiling point will turn into a gas first. And then it gets directed up through this tube, through a condenser, which has cold, cold water running through it, cools it down again, and the gas condenses, and then drips into your receiving flask. And then if you know the compounds that you're looking for, you can put a thermometer in the top here, and that temperature measured at the thermometer will be the boiling point of whatever is boiling at the time. And so it'll go up and then it'll level off when one compound is boiling. As soon as all that compound's gone, the temperature will go up again. And then you can replace this receiving flask to separate out those different compounds um, based on their boiling points. <clears throat> Another one, simple, simpler apparatus here is just using filter paper. So if you make coffee, if you make filter coffee, which I do every morning, <laughs> right? You filter out the grounds because they're larger in size. Um, there are a lot of places in chemistry where that can also be useful in the lab. Um, and yeah, you just pour it through a filter. Sometimes you can use a vacuum to assist your filtration. So you put a, well you have a sealed flask and it sucks air through here. Um, that helps to filter things faster. We will get to do that. That'll be the uh, percentage sulfate in the salt lab. <clears throat> okay, so what we got to a little bit, talked about a bit already, uh, this idea of conservation of mass. There is no new matter. <clears throat> and that, as far as we know, applies to the entire universe. Like in the universe, there's all the matter that has ever or will ever exist. Um, and it's been concentrated into things like planets. I just watched a documentary last night about the solar system. It's good stuff, so I'm thinking about space. <laughs> and the Artemis, uh, the Artemis rocket launches in a few days, which will be the first in a series of rockets to send people to the moon again. Maybe we'll get higher quality video and people won't, well I guess there will still people who will say that we never went to the moon, but. Uh, so matter is ne neither created nor destroyed. And so everything that's reacting in the sun to create all of that heat, those are nuclear reactions. And that sends the heat here. Every, all the matter on Earth um, is just being recycled in one way or another, right? Every time you, um, well, anytime you do anything, right? Nothing is disappearing, it's just moving from another, one place to another. Um, well, in nuclear reactions, you're converting actually some mass into energy. That's, uh, I always like to share this one. Einstein's E equals MC squared. That's a relationship between mass and energy. So for any amount of matter that you convert into energy, you multiply that amount of matter by the speed of light squared. The speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, so that's where all the energy in nuclear, uh, well, nuclear weapons, but also in nuclear reactors comes from. 
In chemical reactions, though, there are no changes. They're so minute um, that we just ignore any changes in the total mass. <clears throat> so in this class, and really in, in general, right, there's no change in the total amount of matter. It stays constant. <clears throat> So we can do this uh, in a simple way, and then this is like, I don't know if you remember in, I think it was the beginning of the chapter two lecture, or maybe it was chapter one, talking about uh, Lavoisier, and he had like his glass spheres, and he burned stuff in them. This is the experiment essentially that he did. He put stuff in there, weighed it before, burned it inside the glass sphere, and then weighed it again. Um, so if we did that, we could take butane and oxygen, um, don't, don't do this at home, by the way. Don't put this in a glass thing and then seal it and then burn something inside of it. <laughs> it creates a lot of heat and the gases expand and it causes a lot of pressure. I just want to say that. <laughs> you do it outside from behind a plexiglass shield with a remote ignition system? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, so if we have butane, we put in 58 grams of butane, we have 208 grams of oxygen, that'll be 266 grams. The carbon dioxide and water that's created on the other side will have the same total mass. And we moved it around a little bit, because now it's no longer butane or oxygen, it's now carbon dioxide and water. Um, so the mass there is coming from how we rearrange those atoms. So this should always be the case. Uh, I'm trying to think if we actually do, I think, yes, 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 yes. We will do some percent yield stuff. Um, there's one lab that I'm very excited to do. If you go on to, I think Chem 1 it is, you'll do it in Chem 1 also. That's called the copper cycle. So we'll take copper metal and we'll dissolve it in nitric acid and then do a bunch of reactions to it and at the end, you'll get that copper metal back. Now, the mass of your copper metal at the end of all of that is going to be less than what you started with, but it's because you lost it other places. So, right, there's gonna be parts where we're gonna be pouring stuff off, um, pouring off solution. If you lose any of that, that's matter lost. So, in real life scenarios, you'll see that your, uh, your yield, your product that you get back will have less mass 99% of the time than what you started with, but it's because it either is still on the glass that you used or it's you accidentally poured some out or it got lost somewhere along the way. Um, if you do it inside of the same vessel though, you should get the same mass. <clears throat> All right, so suppose we have 12 grams of natural gas combines with 48 grams of oxygen natural gas is usually methane, so natural gas plus oxygen, and we combine those in a flame. The chemical change produces carbon dioxide and water. So if we know we've got 12 grams of natural gas, 48 grams of oxygen, and we get 33 grams of carbon dioxide, how many grams of water did we make? Yeah, right? It's just gonna be, because 12 plus 48, that's gonna be 60. And then if we have 33 grams over here, we just subtract the 33 from 60, and that'll give us the 27 grams of the water. And this is kind of an idea that we're gonna be using a lot, is that um, if you have information about part of a chemical reaction, because we know that the um, amount of matter is not changing from one side to another, you can determine a lot of things with just one piece of information. Because we know that that has to be part of a reaction and it will react with however much of the other reactant. So in this case, right, this amount of um, methane or natural gas reacts with this amount of oxygen. And that will always happen in a fixed ratio. 
and it'll always make the same amount of CO2 and water. So these chemical reactions are actually very predictable um, in terms of the amounts that are needed and the amounts that will be produced. If it's, if you're, yeah, if you're given three of the masses like this, then you can calculate what the last mass is. Yeah. All right, so why does anything do anything? Energy. Um, energy is a major component of the universe, um, and it's the capacity to do work. Um, so like in cell phones, we measure the energy as in like milliamp hours. If you get a phone, it's got higher milliamp hours, it's a higher capacity battery, there's more energy contained in it. And that tells you how much work or how many memes you can watch, how many TikToks you could watch or reels on Instagram or whatever, uh, or how long you can scroll on Reddit. And then work is defined as the result of a force acting over a distance. Right? So it takes energy to move something from one place to another, it's a little bit weirder when you're talking about the energy used by phones. <clears throat> but the behavior of matter is driven by energy. So everything is always trying to get to a lower energy state. Um, I guess you can think about it as everything just wants to chill. <laughs> it's like water always flows downhill because it's lower energy. Um, so understanding energy is critical to chem understanding chemistry because it tells us, um, it tells us a lot. Again, it's another piece of information that we can use to figure out how reactions are going to go. So, like we have the law of conservation of mass, there's a law of conservation of energy. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. Um, even if you do something like slap, like I said, I'm being abusive to this table, but if you slap this table, like of course it takes energy for you to move your hand, but now it's got all this kinetic energy, when you slap the table, that kinetic energy gets turned into thermal energy. So even if you can't tell where the energy went, it is being converted from one form into another. Um, and you can't get energy from nothing. That's why all of the perpetual motion machines are always a scam. There's always something else going on, or a battery, or yeah, it's almost always a battery. So the total amount of energy is constant. So you can, um, you can change it from one form into another. That's what like the air conditioning does, is it's taking all of that, well, it's taking the energy to move heat from inside of your house to outside of your house. Right, so that takes work, it requires energy. Um, or I guess the space heater is better. It's taking electrical energy and turning it into thermal energy. Um, and you can transfer uh, energy from one object to another. The easiest way we have of doing that is electricity. So there's a bunch of different kinds of energy, different forms. There's kinetic energy, which is the energy associated with movement. Potential energy, which is the energy associated with position. So if you move something uh, higher up. The electrical energy, which is associated with the flow of electrical charge. Thermal energy, the energy associated with the random motions of atoms and molecules in matter. And we'll talk about thermal energy more today still. And then we have chemical energy. Um, and chem chemical energy is actually a form of potential energy that's stored in chemical bonds. So right, why does, why does burning propane on your grill generate heat? But well, when you're burning the propane, the rearrangement of the propane into, again, carbon dioxide and water, anytime you burn something, it's gonna be carbon dioxide and water, rearranging it, that propane has higher energy than the carbon dioxide and the water that you produce, and so you also produce a lot of heat with it. So you're releasing the energy stored in those chemical bonds, and that's chemical energy.
So the total energy for a sample of matter would be the sum of its kinetic energy, potential energy. So like in a dam, we've got high potential energy of the water behind the dam, then we convert that from that potential energy into kinetic energy, and if there's a turbine in there, we can convert that kinetic energy also into electrical energy and capture some of that. Uh, the units of energy that we're gonna use, we're uh, pretty much exclusively gonna use the joule. But you're probably also familiar with a calorie, and this is calorie with lowercase c. Calorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree C, one degree Celsius. The nutritional calorie is a thousand lowercase c calories or a kilocalorie. So be the energy required to raise the temperature of a thousand grams of water by one degree C. And then the one that's on your electrical bill will be in kilowatt hours. And that's a measure of work done over an amount of time. So if you use a thousand watt space heater, that's, and you use it, run it continuously at full power for an hour, that's using one kilowatt, thousand watts, uh, for an entire hour. Um, so we've got a table of some energy conversion factors here too. Which, what five are we doing this week? Oh yeah, we're doing specific heat and heat transfer this week. Perfect. Even though we were late to getting to this chapter, we're still gonna cover it. <laughs> so these are some of the energy conversion factors. You'll need those for the lab on Wednesday. Or oh, actually, you might need them. I don't think, actually I don't think you need these because we're not using calories. <clears throat> okay, so little practice conversion here though. Uh, if we have well, the complete combustion of a small wooden match produces approximately 512 calories, lowercase c, of heat. How many kilojoules are produced? Everybody's favorite conversion problem. So if we have 512 lowercase c calories, uh, and we wanna get to, let's do this, it's a lowercase k, kilojoules, this is an uppercase J. So if we want to get from calories to kilojoules, then we go from calories, well, what should our first conversion step be? Calories to joules. Calories to joules. So there's 4.184 calories per, or wait, I think it's joules per calorie. I, I got it backwards. Yeah. One calorie is 4.184 joules. And then how do we get from joules to kilojoules? Joules on the bottom, kilojoules on top. And then kilo meaning a thousand. So one kilojoule is a thousand joules. So multiply 512. 4.184 divided by 1,000. This is going to be 2.14. Let me write out the whole thing. Kilojoules, and then how many sig figs should we have here? Three. Yeah, just three. So this will be 2.14 kilojoules. All right, just convert energy units like we do every other type of unit. <clears throat> uh, so physical and chemical changes are usually accompanied by energy changes. So again, it takes some energy to, to cause a physical or chemical change. Um, water evaporating actually requires energy. Um, that's why evaporative cooling works. 
Um, if you have like a swamp cooler, it's cooling because it's evaporating water and that evaporation sucks heat energy out of the air. Um, and the air that comes out on the other side is damp, but cooler. <clears throat> Natural gas burning, then you're releasing that chemical energy. Um, and like I was telling you, right, if you take a, a weight like this and drop it off of a building, when it hits the ground, that energy doesn't just disappear. It actually turns into heat. Uh, similarly, you can slap a, cook, a chicken to cook it. And uh, let me open this up, because I can never remember how many slaps it is. I love that it like looks like a recipe website, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the calculations here. So you can calculate how much energy you have in each slap. Um, so conclusion is that it would take 23,034 average slaps to cook a chicken. Now, the problem with that, of course, is in between every slap, it's going to cool off a little bit. Although I think there is a YouTube video out there that I'm just remembering where somebody tried to do this. <laughs> um, Alternatively, though, you could just slap it once if you could slap at 1,665 meters per second, <laughs> which is <laughs> very, very fast. Uh, do they put the time? Would it depend on the size of the chicken? It would depend on the size of the chicken, so I'm sure he used an average, an average chicken. But uh, so the, uh, the fastest manned jet in the world reaches 980 meters per second. So you'd have to be going like almost twice as fast in a single slap than the fastest jet. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna build a really fast, like rocket-powered robotic arm <laughs> in a vacuum. Yeah, uh, yeah, way easier to just put it in the oven or grill it. Um, anyway, so yeah, the the heat goes somewhere, or the energy goes somewhere, becomes heat. Uh, so systems with high potential energy, this was just talking about with uh, propane, but there are a lot of different compounds that have really high potential chemical energy. Um, and they're unstable because again, everything just wants to chill and they want to get rid of all of that excess energy. So the more energy it has generally, the more unstable it is. Um, for example, TNT, which is trinitrotoluene, this chemical structure has a lot of potential energy in its bonds. It does not like to be like this. There's a lot of strain, um, which is why it's unstable and why there were, I'm sure, many, many, many deaths because somebody dropped a stick of TNT and that was all it took to start one, one of those molecules. All it takes one of them to change, release that energy, and then the rest of them have enough energy to just react. Um, and cause an explosion. <clears throat> okay, so taking this now, apply it to reactions a little bit more. Um, we have two different types of chemical reactions then, right? Some of them, um, not all chemical reactions are going from high energy to low energy. Sometimes we force them to go in the opposite direction because we want to make different products. Um, and sometimes, it ends up being chemically favorable. Well, let me talk about this first. So we have exothermic reactions where energy is released. If you burn anything, so um, combustion or burning, those are gonna be exothermic reactions. They're generating heat. You can feel it, you can feel the heat coming off of them. The other one would be like the uh, uh, hot hands, like little uh, chemical heat, heat packet things, which saved my life. I went, because I went to school in Kansas, and uh, I was on the football team, but there was one playoff game where I didn't play at all. <laughs> so standing on the sideline, and it was, this game was in Iowa, and it was like five degrees outside and windy, and I'm like wearing football gear, which was not super warm, even though I had three shirts on and two pairs of socks. But anytime like one of the other players like ran off the field and like threw their hot hand on the ground, I would like snatch it, <laughs> trying not to get uh, frostbite. Um, 
So in an endothermic reaction, on the other hand, energy is absorbed. And you can get chemical ice packs, and that's what's happening. It's a chemical reaction that absorbs a lot of energy uh, from its surroundings. Uh, that's all right. Chemical ice pack. Those, those types of reactions are more rare. Um, and then these energy diagrams on the right side over here are just showing that the energy level of our reactants is high, and over the course of the reaction, we produce these products that are lower in energy. And that energy has to go somewhere, so it becomes heat. Um, for endothermic reactions, the opposite is happening. Our reactants are low in energy, but the products are higher in energy, so that heat has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the surroundings. Um, one of the things that can help in thinking about is it endothermic or exothermic is um, always remember the chemical reaction is the system. So we're talking about heat leaving that system or heat entering that system. The system, so in an exothermic reaction, heat is leaving. Should have drawn that other box bigger. In an endothermic reaction, heat is being put into the system. <clears throat> ah, that's right. Okay, so in the case of water freezing into ice, is that exothermic or endothermic? Huh? Exothermic. exothermic. Yeah. Yeah, this is the one that, that is a little bit hard to wrap your mind around. But if you think about our ice or our water, I should write water here. If you want to, if you want it to freeze, you have to remove energy from it. And so it's going to be exothermic. All right, because that's what your freezer is doing. The freezer is really cold, and so the heat's moving from the water into that and then into the compressor, uh, which removes heat. And then for natural gas burning, It's exothermic. Yeah, so they both end up being exothermic. Yeah, usually, usually you can tell just by um, whether it's hot, what well, feels hot or feels cold. Um, but if you think about it, you think about ice and it's cold but it's cold because your hand is melting it. So ice melting is going to be endothermic because you're putting heat into that system coming from your hand. Which brings us to temperature. Uh, so next one, okay. So atoms and molecules that compose matter are in constant random motion. Remember. Even in solids, it's like the front, right in front of the stage at a concert. Um, everybody in the concert, they can't really move around, but everybody's like dancing in place. Like they're still vibrating, they're still <laughs> vibing. Um, all of matter is like that. And the amount of energy in that constant random motion is the temperature. And so that's its thermal energy. So the thermal energy is the energy associated with the constant random motion of all the atoms and molecules. You also kind of think of it as their kinetic energy. So how much, how fast they're moving. Uh, so hotter an object, the greater the motion of those atoms and molecules, uh, and then the higher its temperature. So when you record the temperature of something, you're recording its average, energy, average thermal energy. 
So think about barefoot people on beach. Uh, like in the morning, when the sand is still cold, people will be moving slowly across the beach if they're barefoot. But in the afternoon, after the sand's been baking all day under the sun, people move a lot faster over the sand on the beach. There's a lot more energy. All right, so this is the point I want to make. We often like, you know, don't leave the door open because, you, well, not right now because it's summer, but like, don't leave the door or fr refrigerator open because you'll let the cold out. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. There's only heat. So you're not letting the cold out, you're letting the heat in. And when you're holding an ice cube, it feels cold, not because it's putting cold into your hand, because it's sucking the heat out of your hand. And so heat is the transfer exchange of thermal energy. So something feels hot because it's transferring heat into you. This is, um, uh, what's a good example of this? Mm, can't come up with a great one right now. Um, yeah, try, try and think about this one throughout daily life, um, if your hands are already, oh, oh, this was what it was. It's a, there's an experiment you could do where if you take like ice water and your like hand as it is, you put it into the ice water, it's fine, it's cold, right? But if you put your hand under hot water for a while and then put it into the ice water, it feels a lot colder, even though the temperature of the ice water hasn't changed. Yeah, then you go back, that's a great example, yeah. Because when you first jump in the pool, not so bad, but you hop into the jacuzzi, which is like 100 degrees, your body temperature rises. When you jump into the pool, the temperature difference is bigger. So our bodies don't, they're not able to detect like absolute temperatures. They only detect the change in, or the transfer of thermal energy. So if you touch something and it feels cold, it's not because it necessarily is cold, it's just colder than your hand. So that's why an ice cube feels cold because it's colder than your hand, but it's sucking heat out. So that's what heat is. It's the transfer of thermal energy. Um, so if you drop ice into a cup of warm water, um, the heat or thermal energy is transferred from the water into the ice. Temperature, on the other hand, is a measure of that total amount of thermal energy. So it's kind of what is that energy right now with the thermometer? doesn't tell you anything about where that where heat is coming or going from unless you start to measure it over time <clears throat> all right so we got three different temperature temperature scales uh, Fahrenheit which is the one that we're all familiar with or most of us probably are familiar with uh, there's Celsius which the rest of the world is familiar with um, and it's the, the temperature scale that we'll be using almost exclusively in this class. So like if you get a thermometer, which we will on Wednesday, make sure you've got it switched to Celsius. Otherwise, you'll have to convert all of your temperatures. Um, the Fahrenheit scale is, I don't remember why he did it. The guy who came up with the Fahrenheit scale, uh, he just said 32 is zero, and then kind of based everything on that. Um, the Celsius scale said, okay, zero degrees is going to be uh, water freezing, and 100 degrees is going to be water boiling, and we're gonna put just 100 divisions in between there. Right, so one degree is one one hundredth of the way to from freezing to boiling water. The Kelvin scale, those little increments are all the same, but now, instead of um, <clears throat> being just tied to the temperature of water, freezing or boiling, um, it's an absolute scale. So remember, uh, temperature is the energy of the random motions of atoms and molecules. So if we cool something off, that means that they're moving less. So zero Kelvin is when atoms and molecules stop moving, when there's absolutely no motion in them. So that's what makes it an absolute scale. And for a lot of things, we'll have to use the Kelvin scale. Uh, so really the one that you're going to have to uh, memorize is this, that Kelvin is equal to zero, or I mean, sorry, not zero, 
Kelvin is equal to degree C plus 273.15. That's the one that we'll use the most. Um, so if you wanted to reverse that, right, if you have, um, if you have Kelvin and you want to calculate how many degrees C that is, you just subtract 273.15 from both sides. So we get K minus 273.15 equals degree C. The uh, Celsius, all right. The Celsius, uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit is a little bit weird and that's because one degree Fahrenheit is not the same temperature change as one degree Celsius. So, well that and Fahrenheit's freezing water is at 32 degrees C, whereas for Celsius it's zero. So that's what this conversion factor is doing is it corrects for Fahrenheit minus 32, so that makes zero the same. And then dividing by 1.8, um, which is, I think it's five, no, nine fifths or something. Yeah, I think it's nine fifths. Um, that makes the increments the same size. So if you're gonna calculate degrees Celsius from Fahrenheit, it's this equation. And then if you wanna rearrange it, right, if you have uh, Celsius and you wanna calculate what that is in Fahrenheit, um, it'll be 1.8 uh, times your degree C uh, plus 32. So there are very few formulas that we're gonna have. These are some of them, but really you just need to know this one, or going from Celsius to Kelvin. All right, so if we have 358 Kelvin, what is that in degree C? Yes. That'll give us degree C. So this will be 84.85. Now, you don't need to consider sig figs here because that's exactly what the difference is. So it's an exact conversion. That's going from Celsius to Kelvin. All right, so it's just add or subtract 273.15. <clears throat> if we wanna go from 139 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, um, we're gonna have to, let's see, that was 1.8 times our degree C plus 32. So 1.8 times 139 plus 32. So this will be 282.2 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> These conversion factors work differently from the other ones that we've talked about. Um, can't just, there's not like a simple conversion factor where you can cancel out units. <clears throat> so close. Uh, if we wanted to convert, well, yeah, now if you wanna convert negative uh, 321, 321 degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You have to first go from Fahrenheit to Celsius and then to Kelvin. Uh, so this will be negative 321 
and the formula is going to be degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 over 1.8. So negative 321 minus 32 divided by 1.8. Oh, and make sure, this is one of those where you have to put this in parentheses, otherwise your calculator is going to do it wrong. Or it's not going to do what you expect it to do. So this is going to be negative 196.11 repeating degrees Celsius. And then we add 273, uh, and that'll give us Kelvin. Sorry, 273.15. This will be 77 um, zero 04 Kelvin. <coughs> and Kelvin doesn't have degrees. It's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. So the last thing in chapter three um, is heat capacity. And we'll go over it now and then review it again real quick on Wednesday. But heat capacity, it's the amount of energy required to change the temperature of a given substance by one degree C. So how much heat energy do I actually need to put into water to raise it by one degree C? Um, and then we also have the specific heat capacity, <clears throat> which is the quantity of heat required to change the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree C. And our energy there will be in joules. So this is the difference between, um, like if you put a pan on the stove, turn on the heat, the pan gets hot almost instantly, right? The temperature of the pan goes up really fast. If you put water in that pan, suddenly it takes a long time for that water to heat up. Right? You could put your hand in there for a while before it was uncomfortable. Um, that's, what's, that's what heat capacity is. It's how much energy does it take to make it hotter. So for metals, um, and really most things other than water, uh, it doesn't take that much energy to change the temperature. But for water, it takes a lot of energy to change that temperature just a little bit. Oh, and this, this example, a plate of food at a restaurant, if they take your food and it's sitting under a heat lamp for a while, or even you probably experience this at home, you take your food and you put it in the microwave, some things heat up really fast, other things don't heat up as fast. Um, and that's partially due to uh, their heat capacities. So water has a very high specific heat capacity. Um, and this, for this chapter, is a table that you might need. Uh, it is in your textbook also. And yeah, I'll give you specific heat capacities that you need on the exam. You don't need to memorize any of these. So like some things, I mean, again, if we look at like copper or iron, so like a cast iron skillet has a heat capacity of uh, 0.449 compared to water, which is 4.184. So it's 10 times more energy to raise it by one degree C. Uh, this actually is also part of the reason that like San Francisco or places on the coast stay nice and cool because the heat capacity of the ocean is gonna be similar to that of pure water. So even though the sun is beating on it all day, all of that energy just gets absorbed. And the temperature of the water raises very, very little. Whereas around here, the sun is shining onto dirt, which has a much, much, much lower heat capacity. And so the temperature rises really fast. <clears throat> so if you could surround your house with a lake, it would be a lot cooler. <laughs> Yeah, 
it's yeah, I mean, that's definitely going to be part of it. When it gets to the ocean, it's like uh, where the currents are flowing from. So I think here, and as you go farther north, those currents are coming more from the Arctic and down. Whereas as you go farther south, those currents are coming from warmer places. Um, but yeah, definitely that water just coming from the equator where it's getting more sun could be why it's warmer. Uh, so our equation for heat capacity, and this is one of the few actual equations we'll have, uh, is, actually, let me write this out more succinctly, Q equals MC delta T. So the amount of heat it takes to heat up a particular mass of something is that mass multiplied by its specific heat capacity, so that'll be for whatever thing you're trying to heat up, uh, multiplied by how much you're changing that temperature. So Q is going to be our amount of heat in joules. M is the mass of the substance in grams. C is the specific heat capacity. And this delta T uh, means a change in temperature. So this is going to be uh, final minus initial temperature. So if you wanted to heat water up, you want to heat 100 grams of water from, uh, oh, let's say 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius and boil it, you can calculate how much energy that would take. So just enough time to do one example. So let's say you find a copper penny in the snow and pick it up, how much heat is absorbed by the penny as it warms from the temperature of the snow, uh, which is negative five degrees C, to the temperature of your body, which is 37 degrees C. Assume the penny is pure copper and has a mass of 3.10 grams. And then we'll go back and we'll find that heat capacity for copper, because we're gonna need that. So first thing we should do is write out all of our given values. So our T initial, what's our T initial gonna be? Yeah, negative 5.0 degrees C. Our T final? All right, temperature of your hand, 37.0 degrees C. And then the mass of the penny? 3.10 grams. And let me go back to that table. Copper is 0 0.385. So C is the specific heat capacity, 0.385. Joules per gram degree C. <clears throat> so we want to find Q. So our equation is going to be Q equals MC delta T. So Q equals M is going to be the mass of our penny, 3.10 grams, times the specific heat capacity, which is 0 0.385, and that's in joules per gram degree C. And then multiply that by our change in temperature, which is going to be our final minus initial. So 37.0. Uh, minus a negative 5.0 degrees C. Whoops. So we'll get Q is equal to 3.10 grams times 0 0.385 times 37 minus a negative 5 would be plus 5. So this would be 42. 0 0.0 degrees C. Now I'm going to zoom in on this because I want to point this out. So our heat is going to have units of joules. The units of heat capacity are such that if we take grams and multiply it by the specific heat capacity, that'll give us, that'll cancel out the units of grams. And if we then multiply by degree C, that will cancel out units of degree C. 
And so we'll only be left with the units of joules. So, um, I'll have to check. I don't remember if I give you this equation on exams. But if you can't remember it, as long as you can remember the units of heat capacity, um, you can say, oh, I need to multiply this by grams and multiply it by degree C to cancel those out and get joules. Um, and so even in this problem, even though we have a formula for it, it all comes down to canceling out units. Uh, and what is this going to be? 3.10 times 0.385 times 42. So Q is going to equal 50.127 joules. How many sig figs should I have? Three. So this will be uh, 50.1 joules or 5.01 times 10 to the 1 joules. Now, when I say, when, when you're <laughs> doing questions like this, because I saw this a few times, people would write one or the other, just give me one. I know that they're the same thing, and in this case, we can get the correct number of sig figs, um, because even though it's greater than 10, uh, we have three sig figs, so we can put that decimal in there and uh, still get three sig figs. All right. We'll do a couple more examples on Wednesday then. So this does mean that chapter three will be, we'll finish it this week, so chapter three homework will be due Friday. <laughs>